In the 1960s, the development of the Concorde was seen as a technological triumph, a supersonic transport, SST, that could cross the Atlantic Ocean in under three hours. Its sleek delta-wing design, high cruising altitude, and extraordinary cruising speed of Mach 2.04 captivated the public and political imagination as a symbol of national pride and aerospace ambition. However, the program's finances were unstable from the start. Intergovernmental ambition often went beyond realistic financial planning, resulting in initial investments of about 1.3 billion pounds. Unfortunately, these estimates increased over time due to optimistic predictions that did not come to pass as costs rose because of extended development times, increased production expenses, and technical challenges. At the same time, the projected market for supersonic transport became smaller because of rising environmental concerns, like sonic booms and high fuel use, and the 1973 oil crisis. By the late 1970s, the British and French governments found themselves deeply financially and politically committed to the Concorde project. Despite these warning signs, the Concorde program went ahead because of a mix of national pride, intergovernmental politics, and the sunk cost fallacy, which fooled decision makers into thinking further investments could somehow justify past spending. The two consortium partners, British Aircraft Corporation, BAC, and Aerospatial, faced a difficult challenge in commercializing Concorde. Anticipated orders from major airlines never came, with high-profile dropouts from carriers like American Airlines and United Airlines due to concerns about operating costs and limited demand. Only 14 Concords were ever purchased by two state-owned airlines, seven by British Airways and seven by Air France. Despite rising costs, by the early 1980s, the British and French governments continued to invest money into the Concorde project. The sunk cost fallacy, a mistaken belief where more resources are invested in a project due to the significant investment already made, was in full effect. The financial situation became increasingly severe as maintenance and operation costs skyrocketed. A National Audit Office report in 1982 highlighted that the British government was subsidizing Concorde operations to the tune of 17 million pounds per year, with forecasts showing the likelihood of continued operating losses. The government actors, however, focused on the size of their investments were determined to keep Concorde flying, hoping to recover some of their expenses and unwilling to admit to failure, thereby worsening financial losses. As Concorde entered the final years of its operation, the invested money had become truly huge. By the turn of the millennium, the total cost to the British and French taxpayers had exceeded £6 billion. Add to this the cost of refurbishments after the tragic Air France flight AF4590 crash in July 2000, and the numbers continued to climb. The British and French governments, still betting on past money influencing future decisions, invested millions in safety improvements and fleet upgrades, trying to revive an already economically flawed program. Ticket prices of a round trip often hovered around £8,000, catering only to the richest customers. Despite these efforts, the passenger numbers remained too low to make the service financially successful. Ultimately, the unavoidable was recognized. In 2003, both British Airways and Air France announced they would retire their Concorde fleets after 27 years of service. 
The final commercial flights concluded later that year, putting an end to a project that had been driven more by political and pride-related motives than by solid economic judgment. The withdrawal was a clear sign of acceptance that past costs led to even greater losses and that the ambitious venture of supersonic commercial flight had for now reached its end.